Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. And he did. And he taught them to pray by giving them the Lord's Prayer. He gave them and the church Catholic, he gave us a structure, a template, a paradigm to help us learn how to come near to God in prayer. And in Lord's Day 46, the, the Catechism reminded us about the address, why we come to God as uh, our Father in heaven. We, we come to Him in prayer with a childlike reverence and trust. He's our Father. And in a proper and appropriate and healthy relationship between a father and a child, the child knows that he or she can come to dad whenever. Who dares to wake up a great emperor or king at three o'clock in the, in the morning and ask for a glass of water? No one except his child. And so we come to God because he's our father, because he loves us, and we know he will hear us. He cares for us. He knows us, and he, he loves us. We come in childlike reverence and trust. We also come at the same time, with a profound appreciation for his heavenly majesty and power. And that means that when we ask our Father who loves us for help, we know that he can answer. He has the desire and he has the power. Nothing is impossible for him. And so with that, uh, with that attitude of prayer and trust, we come to begin our prayer with the, the first petition that the Lord puts on our lips, which is before us this afternoon, hallowed be your name. That's the first thing that God, that the Lord Jesus teaches us ought to characterize our prayer, a desire for the hallowing of God's name. Now, hallowing or hallowed is a very, very strange and unusual and old word. And I dug around a little bit, and I think the only other context in which we use hallow or something like hallow in modern English is when we talk about Halloween. And Halloween is All Hallows Evening, the, the eve of the holy ones, the eve of the saints. That's what hallow means. To hallow something is to make it holy and to sanctify it. You see that word come back in the answer here, right? Grant us, first of all, that we might, may rightly know you and sanctify you. That's hallow. That's what hallow means. Now, the idea then in hallow is to make holy and to set apart and to not treat as common, but to set aside for special purpose, for the purpose of worship and for the purpose of divine honor. Now, why does the church keep the word hallow if no other English speakers use it besides Halloween? Why do we keep it? Well, we keep the wording because it's ancient. The church is not just a modern phenomenon floating on the froth of the culture of the 21st century. The church is an institution which begins at the beginning of time. And it goes through all of time and all of space and all of history, the church Catholic. And so the church Catholic doesn't just change things quickly. We value new things. We value new workings of God. But we also value the old things. And so because we're part of the church Catholic and because this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, has been prayed for 2,000 years, we don't change it every, every year. We don't change it every time we even have a Bible translation, for instance. You look at the NIV, a very modern translation, a very good translation, and you go to the Lord's Prayer and it uses the, the word hallow. 650 years ago, Wycliffe, in one of the first translations of the Scriptures in New English, used that word, hallow. So it's been in the vocabulary, the prayer vocabulary of God's church in the English-speaking world for over half a millennium. It's a familiar word. It's a word that's in our hearts. And for that reason, the church is reluctant to change it. We could. We can. We don't have to keep the word hallow. We can put sanctify or make holy. But there's a lot of history there. And that's fine. We can tap into that history. 
And so as we look at the Lord's Day before us this afternoon, and it might help you to have your psalm book open so you can follow through in the, in the answer there, remember what we're doing in the third part of the catechism. I think right now your pastor is leading you through the Ten Commandments. And when we get to the end of the Ten Commandments in the, in the catechism, the catechism spend some time thinking about how we can't possibly do them. Even as regenerate, new, um, with people that are made new by the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we can't perfectly keep the law, and that drives us to prayer. We want to. We want to live holy lives, perfectly holy lives, but we can't, even as redeemed believers, and so that drives us to prayer. That's why prayer is in the last section of the Catechism after the law. And so, remember what we're doing as we go through the, the, the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. We're, we're learning to pray. Every year, as the church walks us through the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, the church is teaching us to pray. Now, I find that as a preacher, I often make the mistake preaching on the prayer that I start talking about doing the things that we're praying for. And so, I get distracted. And instead of preaching about prayer, I preach about living life according to the things we're praying for. And, and, and I really want to focus, and I have to do this every year, I really want to focus just on the prayer training. Do, do you need prayer training? I do. I certainly do. Can you grow in your prayer life? Even if you're 80 years old, you can still grow. Even if you've been praying all your life. There's still things we can learn. There's still things we can develop. There are still ways that we can deepen our life of prayer with the Lord. And that's why the church walks us through the prayer every year. So let's look at the answer here. Grant us first of all that we may, uh, grant us first of all that we may rightly know you. That we may rightly know you and sanctify, glorify, and praise you. We're asking God, God, I want you to be the main thing in my life. I, I want my prayer to begin with you, not with my needs, not with me, but with you. That's what I want in my prayer. That's what I want in my life. You think of Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. It's one of the footnoted texts here. Jeremiah 9:23 says this, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. What, what do I hold to be the greatest accomplishment or success, or the greatest and most important goal of my life? What am I looking for? Do I want to be proud of my great wisdom and my great academic career, or my great depth of knowledge about my area of work? Do I want to be known for my might, for my power, whether it's political power, or power within my corporation, or organization, or do I want to go to the gym and, and be, be known as a really strong person? Is that what drives me? Is that what I'm looking for? Or my wealth, is that the driving force that I want to find meaning and significance and, and I, want to, I, I want to find my identity and how many things I have? And, and God says, no, let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me. The desire of the Christian heart is not that I would be with the attitude of, look how awesome I am. Look who I am, and look what I have done. You know, a Christian is never the kind of person that says, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? A Christian is the kind of person that says, do you know who God is? He is awesome. You, O oh Lord, are my heart's desire. I long for you. I long to know you, that you are a God of steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. I want you, God. I want to know you. I want to lift up your name. I want to worship you for who you are. 
That is life. That's what we were made for. The Lord Jesus tells us that in John chapter 17, to eternal life is this, to know the eternal God, to know God the Father and Jesus whom He has sent. There's nothing better. To know Him, to know His name, to worship His name. You see, His name is who He is. And so when we exalt the name, we exalt Him. When we know the name, we know Him. And when His name is upon us, then He is upon us in the power of the Spirit and the glory of the Spirit. We seek to glorify God's name. That means we seek to glorify Him. To declare His name is to declare Him. To be kept in His name is to be kept in Him. To be taught His name is to be taught to know Him. So He and His name come together. And so we want to be hallowed because we want Him to be hallowed. And so hallowing, setting aside as holy and special and to be worshipped, hallowing the name means that we have to know who He is, first of all. And we know Him as He reveals Himself. He reveals Himself to us. For instance, you think of how He revealed Himself to, to Moses as, an all, his, as a God of almighty power and wisdom and goodness and righteousness and mercy and truth. We know Him because He reveals Himself to us. And where does He reveal Himself to us? Well, he reveals himself to us in his word and in his works, in the two books, the book of Scripture and the book of creation. Now, remember, as we were talking about all these things, we're learning to pray here. That's the focus. How do we pray? And, and Jesus is teaching us to start. That's the main thing here in the prayer, to start by telling God that we want to worship him by knowing Him better, so that we can worship Him more. You see, the more you know God, the more you love God, and the more you love God, the more you worship God. And so the desire of the first petition is to know the glory of His person and the glory of His works. What we're praying in this petition is this, Lord, give me more desire to study the Scriptures. Give me a hunger to be before the, the open Scripture, the open Bible, as it is preached and as it is taught and as I study it by myself and with others and with my family, because in the Scripture, I come to know you. And so give me desire to study Scripture, to memorize Scripture, to meditate on Scripture, to hear the Scripture preached so that I can know you more, glorify you more, and worship you more. And then, this is all bound up in this prayer. Also, God, will you let me see you in the other book? The Belgian Confession talks about creation as that most beautiful book of the universe which God created, which God preserves, and which God governs. And in that book of creation, all creatures great and small are like so many letters leading us to perceive the invisible attributes of God, His eternal power and divine nature. And that means, brothers and sisters, that when we pray, hallowed be your name, what we're asking God to do is to open our eyes to see Him in the Word and in the world. We're saying, God, open my eyes. Let me see your glory. Let me see your glory in the rhythm of the seasons. Let me see your glory as the Holy Spirit refreshes the face of the ground in the spring. The scientist looks through their microscope and they, they do that prayerfully. Let me see your glory, O God, creator, in the complex elegance of the cell, in the amazing yet predictable reactions of different chemicals. The student in math class does their work and studies mathematics, asking, hallowed be your name. Let me see your glory, O God, and the elegance and the beauty of mathematics, the language of God, which is basically the code that the universe was written in. We, we, de we desire to see God and His works. 
And we see that everywhere we look, brothers and sisters, you know, a, we talked this morning about a groaning, fallen world, but no matter how groaning and how fallen it is, it cannot hide the power and the glory and the majesty of the Creator. Even in the, the so-called little things of everyday life, the, the mother delighting in warm spring sunshine and freshly baked bread and hot tea and good conversation with a godly friend, the gurgling laugh of a tiny little baby, the overwhelming cuteness of a baby animal, the faithfulness of a loyal pet, the comfort of a hug from a loved one, the satisfaction of standing back and looking at a finished project and finding joy in a job well done. I think that's a feeling that you had at the end of the renovation here. Just things where you just see God's goodness. And you see His character shining through in the way that the world works, the way that the works of His hands are. And this is God. And this is from God. And these are the works of God. And we ask in the prayer, let me see that, Lord. Open my eyes to see it. Let me see your glory in all things, in all your works. I remember an old man speaking to his little granddaughter, and, and every time they walked out of the house, they would stop. There might be a little bee on the clover on the grass. There might be a little weed, a little dandelion, a little flower popping up. And he would always stop, and he would say to this little grandchild, look at the work of God. Look at the beauty of the work of God. And he taught her to see God in his works. That's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. We really need to work hard on that nowadays, because a lot of our kids in, in modern culture, uh, a lot of the children in modern culture are just sucked into that fake world of frothy colored pixels in the gaming and the internet. And, and you don't see God. You see man. Man is great. Man is glorious. Man is powerful. We need to get out, us and our kids, into the creation. That's part of praying this prayer, hallowed be your name. So what we're asking for in this prayer is, Lord, don't let me be dull. Don't let me be blind. Don't let me be like a trumpet that doesn't make a sound or like a cello with half of its strings missing. Because to know you is to praise you. And so let me know you, God. Let me see your almighty power, wisdom, goodness, righteousness, mercy, and truth shine forth in all your works. And when I see you in your works, let me worship. Let me hallow. Let me glorify. Let me praise you. So what are God's works? Everything. His creation. The universe, His Word, His redemptive acts in Christ, His providence, His answers to prayer, healing granted, help given. Take any aspect of reality, and it is possible to break out into praise and worship, to exalt the name of God. And so, again, I want to emphasize this. Part of praying this prayer, part of living in this prayer prayerfully is that we do need to take the time to teach ourselves and our kids to wonder and to worship. That's one of the main reasons for education, to study the world, to learn to see God, to know God in his works. In every subject matter, Every detail of this beautiful world we live in, God is good in all things. What does the apostle say? He says this, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, no exceptions, do all to the glory of God. Now, I could preach an entire sermon just on that because it's a text in the Scriptures. But that's something to chew on. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's the prayer of the first petition. Lord, help me do that. Help me do that in everything I do. Help me to glorify you. 
And so that's the first part. And then we get to the second part, the, the grant also. So those two sections, we're in the second section now. Grant us also that we may so direct our whole life that your name be always honored and praised. And so in that very, very long sermon title that I, it's almost a sermon in itself here on the liturgy sheet, uh, maybe that disappears a little bit, but I really wanted to focus on that Jesus is teaching us to pray for God to help us to magnify him, to exalt him in all things and at all times. We already talked about the all things, now I want to talk about and at every time. What does the scripture say? Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And so what we're we're asking God for in this petition is we're saying to God, look, you made me to worship you. That's why I exist. So don't let me fail, Lord. I need your help to be who you made me to be, to, to be who you created me to be, to do what you created me to do. That's the reason I am. I exist for one reason and for one reason alone, to magnify, to glorify, to worship my Creator. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 43, 7 speaks about everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. We exist for Him, in Him, to Him. And our prayer is saying, Lord, I can't do that. I cannot do that by myself. I cannot do that in my own strength. Because all I can do, if you leave me to myself, all I know how to do is sin. That's why I'm praying. I'm praying, Lord, that you would not let sin prevail. Don't let my life and my choices end up bringing shame on me and my family, my community, and on you. But take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I need to worship you, Lord. That's what I'm asking for here in my whole life. My whole life needs to say God is good in everything and all the time. Am I going through pain and loss? What do we do as Christians, as children of God, when we suffer pain and loss? We magnify the name. We worship Job chapter 1. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. This guy is in agony. He's tortured and sore. He's lost everything and everyone. And he worships. He magnifies. He hallows the name. In this prayer, we're saying, Lord, can you make me do that too? When you bring me through loss, can you make me worship you? Because I can't do that by myself. I need your spirit to do that in me. Are we going through suffering and persecution? We worship. Think of Paul and Silas. They were beaten up. They were thrown in jail. And at midnight, what are they doing? They're singing and they're praying. They're worshiping. When God gives us a special and unexpected calling which is going to turn our life upside down, what do we do? We're praying, Lord, help me to worship you. Didn't our sister Mary do that? When the angel came and told her something very, very unusual is going to happen in your life, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah. That turned her life upside down. And what did she do? She hallowed the name. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. That was her reaction. And when God sets us free and grants deliverance, what do we do? Well, we hallow the name. We we worship. Moses and the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 15, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. And these, all these examples of different times and different occurrences and situations, what Jesus is teaching us to do is to ask God to work that in us. Does he give us joy and success? Then we say, God, help me to worship. 
James chapter 5, verse 13, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. You know, about 500 years ago, or maybe a little less, in the 1600s, the, the Dutch Navy was incredibly powerful, and I would think that a number of people here perhaps uh, have historically some connection in their family background to the Netherlands. And in the 1600s, it was a world power, that tiny little country. They defeated the combined English and French fleets in one battle, two other superpowers in the world, and they beat them together. And after the battle, the naval battle, they cleaned the decks and they assembled together, and they said to one another, it was the will of God. They didn't say, wow, we are so cool, and we, we whopped them. They said, it was the will of God. And they worshiped, and they sang psalms. You often see that with Christian athletes, right? An athlete, a Christian athlete, wins a game or, or does a great feat of athletics, and, and they point to the sky. What are they saying? They're saying, to God be the glory. They're worshiping. They're magnifying. They're hallowing the name. And we're asking God to do that in our lives. We're saying, Lord, make my life like that. That doesn't matter when, doesn't matter what, that's what I'm doing. That my life is, is a living sacrifice of thankfulness in all things, at all times, a continual service of worship. That I, together with the psalmist, am always asking, what shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're praying for. That's what Jesus is teaching us to pray for. Lord, give us that mindset. Lord, give me that perspective. Lord, give me that worldview. Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be, before anything else, I want to be a worshiper. Make me want to be a worshiper. And then make me want that even more. Lord, incite me to do what I was created to do, to exalt you in everything and at every time. To ask the question in every situation, how can this incite me, how can this bring me to worship the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? In this, with this, and through this. And brothers and sisters, as we pray this, of course, it means that we don't just rattle off the Lord's Prayer unthinkingly. That's why we stop and we dig into it every year. But as we pray this from the heart and with the mind, you will find that as God answers this prayer, your life will be filled more and more with unceasing prayer. And you will begin to taste the glory of the eternal heavenly worship towards which he is lifting you up. Because, brother and sister, when, when sin is gone and when he's wiped every tear from our eye, we won't need to ask him to make this grow in us anymore because we're just naturally going to do that. When sin's gone, we will perfectly, without sin, worship him into all eternity. Every moment, every detail, every thought, every word, every action will resonate with eternal glory. That's where we're headed, and that's what the Spirit is working in us right now. That's why our life of prayer needs to be a life of growth. That our life, that's the desire here, is that our life would be a prayer of praise which is aligned with the worship of heaven so that we're saying together with the angels and the elders and the four living creatures in Revelation chapter 7, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen.